Long-time viewers of this channel will be aware of how sometimes what can happen is I could be doing a video on one particular topic, make a throwaway comment about something else, and then that something else will end up having its own dedicated video a bit later on, because everything seems to intertwine in such a significant way, at least sometimes. It's a bit like those old Six Degrees of Eric Clapton things you might have seen in the guitar magazine if you read them or read them, where it seems that if you can go from one person, six jumps, and then you end up at Eric Clapton, because that guy's everywhere. I guess this series version of that is, well, Roberto Moreno. I know, I know, I know, I know, you're all excited because it's nearly 100k, but it's not going to be a case of, it's clicked over to 100k, here's the video. It will probably take a bit of time to do it. It will be done, just going to have to be a bit patient with it. I'll probably do it once the play button arrives. But anyway, with that piece of housekeeping out of the way, I mentioned in the Tyrrell video last time out how the team was the first to have one of these raised nose cones that became the default design of cars for about 10 years or so. And it's actually interesting because the cars of the 90s are some of my favourite ever built, looking back on them now, that is. They were advanced enough to have a decent amount of grip, but not too advanced like they are now. For me, they're that perfect middle ground. And it wasn't an aesthetic choice either, the teams weren't building them in the hope that a 33 year old would look back on them and go, oh yeah, those cars were cool. They actually did it because of science. At the tail end of the 1980s into the first years of the 1990s, the teams were running these sorts of nose cones. I remember on Grand Prix Manager you could select between these sorts of noses and then the raised style noses. One was cheaper, one was more expensive. Although there were other reasons for having these low nose cones. Because of the ban on ground effect, Formula 1 teams were running their cars insanely low to the ground, kicking up all manner of sparks as they scraped along, and the teams had been putting skid blocks on the cars to help protect the floors. By running the cars low to the ground, they were able to accelerate the air underneath towards the diffuser and get that much needed sucking. More suck from the diffuser means less rear wing needed. Less rear wing means less drag. Less drag means more straight line speed. So when Tyrrell turned up to the 1990 San Marino Grand Prix with an anhedral front wing, it's very tricky to say that, an anhedral front wing, the other team started looking at it and going, what's this then? I'll turn it into a German Shepherd then. Ow. Designed by Harvey Postlethwaite, this car was designed to try and take advantage of the laws of physics and aerodynamics to effectively get as much air as possible under the car and get that diffuser to do its magic. If we look at a car from a few years prior to this, like this MP44, the air is going to hit the front wing first, get disturbed, then go under the car. With the Tyrrell, that hole in the middle means, at least in theory, the air is going to be less disturbed and then be accelerated under the car thanks to the Bernoulli principle. What happens under this principle is that when there is an increase in the speed of a fluid, in this case air, there is a decrease in the pressure. That low pressure pocket around the diffuser allows the car to be held to the ground. The same principle is used today on the modern cars with the Venturi tunnels. As the Tyrrell had less dirty air being fired under the car, the theory was that everything underneath it would be a lot more effective. It's probably why around the peak of ground effect in sort of 81, 82 or so, some cars weren't running front wings at all because of the need to get as much air through as possible. McLaren and Arrows both tried it. At least, those are two teams that I can name off the top of my head that have done it because I'm not going to go through pictures of every single car that did it. I don't want to keep you all day. But as we learned in the video on Tyrrell's downfall, they had the ideas, but not the money to develop. The other teams saw an opportunity to copy and improve on it. And the first of those teams was Benetton. At the San Marino Grand Prix of 1991, Benetton turned up with the all-new B191 that, like the Tyrrell, had got one of these raised portions to the nose that had a hole in the middle to get air going underneath the centre line of the car. It was the brainchild of Rory Byrne and John Barnard. Now, we need to do a throwback to the previous video. The story goes that Barnard, working at Ferrari's Guildford Technical Office, the Ferrari GTO, LOL, had been working on the 1989 car and said to Postlethwaite, who was his man on the ground in Italy, that he needed some testing done in the wind tunnel. Somebody at Maranello, whether that was Harvey or somebody else, said it couldn't be done, and every time Barnard needed something put it through the wind tunnel, for whatever reason, he wasn't allowed to do it. So he got on a plane, went to Maranello, and found Piero Ferrari and Harvey Postlethwaite testing a model that looked like what would become the Tyrrell 019. So this B191 could have been John Barnard saying, alright, hold my beer, watch this. But it wasn't exactly a Lotus 79 style revolution. It's not like everybody in 1991 had turned up with one of these noses. 
Benetton was the first to go with what we think of the standard front assembly. It was still an experimental phase because Benetton went with a raised nose and a flat front wing. Jordan went low nose and anhedral front wing, and Footwork went with something called the monopost nose, which had the nose go to a point, almost like an arrowhead, and then they fixed that to a flat front wing with a single column. It's also a good point to consider here that in the period 1991 to 1993, teams were starting to get on board with things like active suspension, traction control and other gizmos that might have been an alternative to the raising of the nose, which might have been a reason for not going that route and sticking to what worked with them already until it was clear that this new design philosophy worked, or not, as may be the case. It wouldn't be until about 1995 or so that most of the teams had flicked over to this raised nose design, but not only was it good for aero, it was also good for the driver's seating position. The MP44 was one of the first Formula 1 cars to use this reclined seating position, having the driver reclined was better for centre of gravity purposes, and as Formula 1 cars were starting to get more advanced through the 90s, there came the point where the team started having the drivers reclined in their seats with the feet up, something David Coulthard often described as like slouching in a bathtub with your feet up by the taps. These nose designs better facilitated that seating position. By 1996, all but one of the teams had migrated over to the high nose design, and the noses themselves had become a little bit more bulbous on the monocoque because that's where they were sticking the driver's feet. Some of this switch might have been because of the safety changes throughout 1994, higher ride heights meaning a bigger gap between the car and the track, plus the introduction of the plank, so having a higher nose meant more air going under the car to get back what they lost, if that makes any sense. By the start of 1996, only Ferrari was still using this conventional nose design to use the terms used in Grand Prix Manager. What a game! You could get pole position with a 40 by using the do or die driver instruction and be 4 seconds faster than Damon Hill's Williams. Broken game, but I had fun with it. At the end of 1995, it was almost a split between who was and wasn't using it. The centre line of the car was where they needed to exploit the airflow, and they did. Simtek almost had a 2005 style setup with the front wing higher to get the airflow going under the front wing. So did Tyrrell. There was actually a safety aspect here too, not only could you build them to disintegrate in the event of a crash, they also stopped the cars being used like launch ramps. I'm also going to leave a link in the description or a pinned comment to a site where this guy built models of Formula 1 cars in some sort of fluid dynamic software and did all the necessary tests to figure out which of these designs was best. He used all the designs used in this time period. Low nose as used by the likes of McLaren and Williams in 1991, anhedral wing like Jordan and Tyrrell used, horizontal front wing like Benetton's, high nose and monocoque when the drivers started sitting like they were in a bathtub with their feet on the taps, High nose and full span flap which added a centre flap to the front wing and the footwork and 40 style monopost design. If you can decode all of the numbers in that post you're going to really enjoy looking through it, but the long and short of it is as follows. The drag coefficients between the low and high noses were minimal in their differences, but the real difference is made elsewhere. With high noses they produce less overwing downforce but they help produce more underbody downforce and the low pressure generated is much higher than those old style noses. Add the full flap behind the main plane of the front wing and you'll see that downforce increases at the front but rear downforce decreases as the full span flap gets in the way of producing low pressure under the car, with the author finalising the results by saying that it's inferred that the amount of airflow in the area from the nose to the centre of the front wing influences the amount of airflow below the floor. So by the end of the 1990s they were kind of going half and half with the design, they'd have the main plane and then have the other flap behind, it was pretty much full span but they cut like a U shape out, so you had that little pocket there where the air could effectively go through and you get the best of both worlds, if you follow me. The best cars to look at for that kind of design are the Ferrari 310B from 1997 and also the MP413 McLaren from 1998. As you can probably tell in the change of mic tone here, I had a thought just after I finished recording. I figured it would be best if I showed you on some models, because some of you will be able to visualise what I'm talking about, because you might be anoraks and love this sort of thing, and some of you might be new to all of this and, well, might not speak English as a first language, so I'm doing this to make sure that everybody is included. Here we have a selection of cars that I have on hand in Assetto Corsa to show you the different types of the noses that were used pre and post revolution if you want to call it that and I'll leave links for the cars in the description if you haven't got them in your game. The MP44 on the far left is the low nose and flat front wing and also has a full flap on that 
front wing if you follow me from what I was talking about earlier. The green Jordan 191, which is only here to get Glenn Freeman's attention to be honest, has a similar setup to how Tyrrell had theirs, with quite a large secondary flat behind. The Williams FW19 is what you remember those noses being by the late 90s, while the McLaren is what I've just talked about, a large secondary flap but with that huge cutout behind the centre point to maximise the airflow under the car, although by this point barge boards and other aero deflectors had started making their appearances on the cars by this point. Adrian Newey moments basically. So when I said high nose full flap, imagine the Benetton or the FW19 that you've just seen with the setup that the McLaren has here. The flap runs entirely behind the main plane of the front wing. I can't find any pictures of anyone that actually ran that setup, they all ran with this bit of a cutout, but the MP413 is by far the most extreme. I'm just assuming that the guy that ran all those tests did it to make sure that every type of wing design is covered. So into the turn of the millennium, car noses started getting variations to them as the FIA improved crash testing and bits and pieces like that. Charlie Whiting was also starting to mandate some changes to them just to be safe. Noses started to lower around 2001 because Whiting was trying to avoid fatalities in the event of a T-bone accident, where a high nose could catch the top of a side pod, launch the car up and into the driver's head. It's interesting to see stuff like that. I looked at one of those every F1 constructor's winner posters that shows how the cars were evolving. Sort of 1994 to 2008, that must have been the most stable regulations ever. You can see how the cars evolved. In 2009 though, the high noses returned, but they did present their safety issues. Mark Webber in 2010 at Valencia is the prime example, and this led to a rule change for 2012 that means that the designers... Well, they kind of took the piss a little bit. Again, extra info time because I can show you a bit more accurately here. Here's the 2009 Williams next to a Red Bull. The noses in 2009 were sort of an in-between, like they were sort of 2002 to 2004, something like that. But then in 2010, they became higher up. And as we saw with Weber at Valencia, it wouldn't be the case of a car being hit being launched into the air. It would be the car hitting the other car that would be launched into the air as the high nose catches the rear crash structure of the car in front and then that sort of just lifts everything up and, and over. Because of accidents like Weber at Valencia and also what happened to the Michael at Abu Dhabi that same year, the FIA told the teams that for 2012, all cars had to have noses that were 550mm from the reference plane, a decrease in the 625mm that were seen in 2011. The designers worked out that the best way around this and to keep the downforce that those high noses would have given them is to design the so-called platypus noses that a lot of people cried about because they were ugly. The FIA would allow a modesty panel that smoothed off that transition for 2013. But because of the shunt at the Belgian Grand Prix of 2012 which resulted in Grosjean nearly taking Alonso's head off, the FIA had to change things for 2014. 550mm became 185mm where the designers took the piss again. They wanted as much airflow under the car as possible, so they started designing these noses that were cut off as they crossed the main plane of the front wing and then stuck what we now know as the dildo noses on the end so they complied with the rules. And people cried that they were ugly again. Three races into the season and one of these low nose cars launched another one into the air like it was a round on Robot Wars, although Maldonado was barreling into that corner at a rate of knots so it's hard to ascertain whether it was actually the low nose that was to blame for the accident. But like I said, these cars are probably my favourites. Analog enough, but with still enough power and downforce to have, well, decent performance. And I guess the colour schemes were fun too, with the Williams being a firm favourite and the West McLarens being a big part of my childhood. Ah, nostalgia. But it's also one of those pieces of innovation that goes under the radar a bit. You think of 90s innovation, and it's the FW14B and the FW15C that spring to mind, although a video on Senna's McLaren from 1993 is also a topic for the future, because that car was more advanced than people think. But I guess one thing you can say about these noses from the 90s is that they were function and form. It's not often you get to say that, is it? So then, a look at how Tyrrell kickstarted something pretty interesting in the early 1990s. If this has been something you've enjoyed and learned something through, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job, and at the same time, please the Al Gore rhythm. And for more stuff from this channel, subscribe and get that bell on so I finally click over 100k and we have ourselves a party or something. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help support me at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials and affiliates. Japanese Grand Prix merch now on sale at the F1 store. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.